Shining happy faces. It's nice to see you guys. We've got Jim Moore with us today, and I am so excited about this call. So I'm going to jump right in um, because I've been trying to bring up all the good stuff before you guys got here, and I and it's been all. And so I was like, okay, we have to talk about something boring. So, <laughs> okay, you guys, everyone knows Jim. Jim's been around. I contacted Jim when I first started narrating. I don't remember what the question was, but I contacted you because I had no idea what I was doing. You were one of those people that was nice to somebody that was a newbie and didn't have a clue. And since knowing you, I see the projects that you do and that you put out, but not only the projects, your stories, your writing. Jim has a fascinating background and your photography and okay, it's birds. So you've got me there. I'm a big fan. <laughs> but I think the thing that I'd really, there's so much we can focus on, but the thing that I'd really, and I get calls and questions every single day because everyone knows how much I love doing public domain books but people don't know how to start and they're very, very intimidated by them. And I did, I remember I referred someone to them and they were like, oh, that's the oldie stuff. I'm going to ruin it if I try to do it. It's, it was a classic writer. And I was like, you're not going to ruin it. This, the joy of working on a book written by one of the greats, I mean, it reminds you of why you're here. And the thing about Jim is Jim knows joy. I don't think, I think you might be so much an artist. I don't think if you tried to stop, I noticed you during the pandemic doing weird design digital board games just so you can do art. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jim, and also Jim has a fascinating background. Jim. Hello. Tell us about yourself and the Oscar behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'm I'm an I'm an oldie, uh, so everything I say comes from the perspective of seventy, almost seventy-two, and that means having been born in the last first half of the last century, so I feel ancient. But I not. grew up in. I grew up in two worlds. I grew up in one side of the world, which was my mother's world, which was Hollywood. Her grandfather was a fellow named Charles Brackett, and he was a screenwriter and producer. And Charlie produced Sunset Boulevard, Lost Weekend, Titanic in the 1950s, The King and I, a lot of movies that my generation grew up with. And as a result, he, he got four Oscars, three Golden Globes, a lot of stuff. But mostly what he was, was a great reader and a great speaker and a very loving, kind man who had family, big family issues. There was in the family um, alcoholism. There was in the family sadness. And he worked very hard to come through that, always with his double-breasted suit and his beautiful handkerchief in his pocket and a great stentorian New England slash English approach to speaking. And he was always quite refined about how he spoke. And <laughs> I remember watching him one night on the Academy Awards and he was speaking and I thought this is this is the voice I I should have and years later my youngest daughter got a birthday present for me which was a compilation of all his um, speeches at the academy wow. and someone who was with us was watching and said well that's your voice and that was a huge compliment at the time I have a so, question can I interrupt yes. you for one second? I have a question. Sure. Um, how does it feel, because living in LA for a long time, you see it around you, but not being from it. Recently, they did a documentary about my uncle, who's not even close to that famous. I mean, he's an obscure poet. And 
I watched the documentary and I felt this strange mix of pride that this is in my blood and like I was deflated a bit because it was in my blood and what you you look at yourself and your life and everything how did it feel growing up did you grow up in Hollywood surrounded no. by all of this did you feel separate or a part of it no I was very lucky on that side because on my father's side we were military mm. and he was a, a West Point grad a World War II fighter pilot and we had moved to Washington DC where I was born and my father made the Air Force a career and that meant that we were very peripatetic we were everywhere we were in Germany, we were in France, we were in England, and then we were in Virginia, Ohio, Louisiana, Nebraska, uh, California, Colorado. And that took me away from being infected by Hollywood. So you it were able to develop a secure gym persona on your own. Very, very loving, close family without any of the glitz and glitter, but we could go off at, at Christmas or in summer vacations. So I got to enjoy my grandfather and that world in bits and pieces, as opposed to being totally filled with it. And my father was a very conservative guy, uh, living on military bases, living on the economies in small town America. We, we learned the humility of that side of American life. But I bet Not, your mother was glamorous still, huh? She, she tried awfully hard. And she was a beautiful <laughs> woman. She was an artist, a singer, pianist, and a very loving mom who I think in her heart of hearts would have loved to have stayed in Hollywood. And she had actually screen tested and I guess did well, but marriage and children and the war caused the, the separation of choices. And she took the, I think the best route, which was to be with, um, to be with my dad and to be with us as, as we were growing up. And I benefited because I sat with her on next to her easel when she was painting. And I sat next to her on the piano bench and listened to her sing. And she took us to museums and we got to see art and history and science. And so I, I got it from all, I got good stuff from all sides. Yeah, and I feel, because you can, just in everything you write and everything you do, you can, you seem closer to the movies and the people and the history than, than, if you were to have just read the book. You, and that brings me to your public domain books. I'm going to skip back and forth and back and forth because yeah. you've taken on books for the pure love of it. Every single book you do, am I right that it's like all consuming while you're doing it? Can I ask uh, what your process is? The, the process, I, I need to preface by saying one, why they are my favorites. Okay. When I was little, I'm going to regress a moment. I was blinded for about half a year. I had a chemical spill that blinded me in both eyes. And my, my, I was bandaged and in bed. The doctors didn't know back in the 50s. They didn't know if a four-year-old, five-year-old boy's eyes would heal or not. Oh, God. So people, my parents read to me every night. And my grandfather would call from the West Coast. And my mother would put the phone up to my ear and he would read to me. And then people like uh, the actor James Mason or um, Raymond Massey or just names of the time would spend 20 minutes reading to me. Wait, the woman, the woman <laughs> serious? Yeah, the woman who wrote 101 Dalmatians, Dodie Smith, read that book to me from England while I was blinded. So, How old were you? Well, I was between four and five. So what I remember is I remember the intimacy of the spoken word. I, I, I could, because I couldn't see it and I was too little to read, 
but I was getting the classics. They weren't reading children's stories to me. Yeah. They were reading Robert Louis Stevenson and they were reading Richard Halliburton's World of Travels. And but that's what happened. comes out in your voice, Jim. That's well, what I hear in your narration. That's amazing. Because you have to give back. The whole point, that's why I used to read for the Washington Ear, reading news to the blind. Yeah. Uh, why I read for years for Learning Ally, so that dyslexics would be able to read. There are people who are challenged in ways that we can't imagine. And if you are suddenly challenged that way, you get a great appreciation for what it is they hunger for. But that's what you do in your narration. If anybody listens to one of Jim's samples, you can hear it immediately. You're sitting next to the person's bed, reading to them. You can hear you're having an intimate conversation, but you've mastered it. Well, and that's something to, you're, I'm still you're working kind. on. Uh, as usual, <laughs> as usual, Daniela, you are very kind. No, it's true. I seat. stand by it. But uh, to, to get to your question. Yes. After when I first started audiobook narrations in 2013 with B Audio, thank God for Helen Lloyd mm -hmm. and for Mike Kitson and people who brought me into it. Um, when things began to taper off with B as they were changing their model. I wanted, there was, I needed to read long form. I love long form. And I found out about uh, what is now today Spoken Realms. Mm. And Spoken Realms was willing to take me on for a book called The Virginian. And it's a, it's a great sweeping Western from the early 1900s written by Owen Wister. It's a 15 hour book, I think, with something like 28 characters. And wow. I had done theater. We had all, all, you know, all of us have kind of, but I'm not like Shannon Elizabeth or, or uh, Sean. Wait, that was your first, that wasn't your first audio book, yes, was it? It was, it was, no, no, it 15. wasn't my first audio book. My first audio book was- You'd been doing the other ones. Yeah. Yeah, there were others. So, I took this on as a challenge. I read the book and I absolutely loved it. It wasn't the Virginian that people saw on television. Hmm. It was a Western sweeping heroic love story novel with black hats and white hats and just the, the kinds of gravelly voice people and then those <laughs> boom arm people and the how, how you kind of people <laughs> and all that kind of stuff going on. <laughs> and the Chinese people, it was everything. And I thought, my gosh, this is, this is just the world right in front of me. And I get to narrate it and someone else is going to help me get it out there. So the Virginian was the first one. And I never looked back and thank God for um, Spoken Realms and Stephen J. Cohen and Mike Vendetti Helen Lloyd and all of those, and Jenny Hoops, who has been one of the greatest loves of my life when it comes to audiobooks. Jenny's amazing. Uh, Bobby Vanyuk, every editor I've ever had, they have all embraced me as I've tried to tell these public domain stories, and I I just fell in love with public domain. But your now your process. I just, I have this picture of you as Daniel Day-Lewis of audiobooks, because like you seem to be so enraptured with each book. Does it like kind of like own you during the course of doing the book? Are you like thinking about the book and? Oh, oh, totally. Um, all you have to do is ask anybody who followed my efforts to get the 480. Out I remember there. all your posts about the 480. And it was a two-year effort just to get the right from the family to read the book. It's not wow. technically public domain, but it's such a, for me, it was an important book. The author had died a year after he wrote it. He was noted for other books that he wrote, like Failsafe. And his 101-year-old 100 year widow, at the time 99, was still alive. And when I heard from his daughter that when his wife heard my voice reading his words, she said, that's the first time I've heard his voice since he died. Oh. 
And when you have a book like that, that has an impact, I don't care how it sells. It, I really don't. And I couldn't have done it without PJ because he came in to help me with three different kinds of accents. Shannon Elizabeth Parks came in to help me with the acting out part. Um, everybody joined me in this community of support to get out a book that I wanted out and couldn't any other way. But it was, I lived it. I lived it for two years. I read it over and over. I knew the characters and I knew how important it was. And I've done the same with the latest book that, that's out now, the, the, uh, the science fiction book, yeah. Killer of Fire by Ray Bradbury. And when you, when you get your head into the author and you picture the author in his or her office writing in longhand or typing out on an old Olivetti or a Royal or just walking and pacing and figuring it out. And then you get, oh, that's what they meant. Oh, oh, oh I see where that's going. Yeah. And did she really say, no, would she say it like this? Or would he go, oh, no. It, it, slowly but surely, you become your own stage manager, your own director, your own critic. You know how, it, and then you hit the you hit the mic button and you start recording, and away you go on someone else's adventure. But you get to be with them. Do you find that you grieve the book when it's done? Every time. Yeah, like Every that's how I felt. Time. Frankenstein. I was actually depressed for a week. When I hit <laughs> when I hit the send button to Spoken Realms with the, with the final zip folder and it goes off into the ether and I sit back and I, I can feel the silence come here into the dungeon and I'm re I, I need to find something else. I need to fill the void again. So I jump on Gutenberg, which is where I go first. And I go to Project Gutenberg and I begin looking at what's out new, what sci-fi, what long form, and then I send in, if I, first I read the book, I download it on eight, on all, always. I read it at least twice before I decide whether I want it. And then I send a note to Spoken Realms and I say, here's the project. And they hit, sign the contract. You're on your own and away you go. And the cover and this is, I brought Jim, so many people have asked me about public domain. And the minute I say, oh, and the best part is you've got to do the cover. <laughs> and then they get really quiet and disappear. <laughs> and yeah. So I thought it would be nice for Jim. Jim is going to show us some of his covers and tell us because Jim is the master. Do you do the cover after the book? Do you already have the idea for the cover? Do you? Uh, it's always after the book. Okay. Always after. Sometimes Are you thinking it, about it ahead of time or? Yes, it's important. And we had once talked about um, the elements of the sample of the book. Mm. If you recall, what, yes. what makes someone choose the sample? And for me, the sample and the cover are one and the same. In the sample, you want a portion of the book that has tension you want a portion of the book that has at least a character of emotion. You want something that gives direction and flow of plot. And then you want something that goes, what? If you can get your reader, your viewer, your potential buyer to go, what? You might have hooked them. And that's I love that. I confess I've been using the beginning of the book. You know. See, Never my, ideal. My rule is to never go to the beginning of the book. Yeah. My rule is to start with the second fifth of the book. Okay. I divide, I divide plots into five parts usually. And the second fifth is where things begin to happen. Characters begin to reveal themselves. Plots begin to form. The foundation is often first chapter. It's pouring the concrete, digging a hole. And then as you work your way up, you start having the posts, the beams, the walls, all of that. And, and that's where 
you find the characters revealing themselves to you for the sample. And it's frequently where you find the thought maybe for the cover. So on, on rarely do I do a cover immediately. I think about it. It takes me a while when I've finished, but before I can't do the cover before I send it. I mean, before I send it to Spoken Realms. I mean, it's got to yeah. all be in the package. So to answer your question, because I'm blabbing long. No, no, no. This is great stuff. I'm going to re-listen to this the next time I do a sample. Yeah, I do the art. I do the art after, but I'm thinking about both the art and the sample almost at the same time. Some exceptions. Great Gatsby was an exception. Great Gatsby. How did you come up with that cover? That cover is beautiful. Because in the last three chapters of the book, the cover reveals itself. There is one element that suddenly jumps out out of Every element in that book, as far as I'm concerned, other than the green light at the end of the pier, Daisy's house, there is a yellow car. And the yellow car plays a key role. And it's the tipping point in the relationships of everybody in the book. What happens in the yellow car to the yellow car and what the yellow car does to somebody becomes that moment when the reader just goes, oh, and you you know it's over. Wait till they see it because that car somehow has a personality. See, and you made me realize something. Do you know what I realized? I thought I was crazy, but the books that I like to do public domain are books that I loved for some reason or another in the past. And usually I dream about the cover first. And I have to search oh, oh, my wow. memory to remember what book that cover where that image is from. And mm -hmm. then I find the book on Gutenberg and fill in the blanks, but the cover is okay. done in my head before I even look at the book. That's fascinating. I, I never thought about that. I thought, why do I come up? But I do, I always think of, I always see the, the scarlet letter. I had that cover. I knew that cover I for years. That. No, 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 that's inspiring. That's really kind of cool. It's a bit crazy, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but then you're Daniela. I mean, come on. I, I, I like to yeah. think we can get away with all our eccentricities, and we call it <laughs> art. <laughs> so, um, would this be a good time to show the? Sure. So we have this, and let me go ahead and start with slideshow. If I recall how to do it. Did you draw this image? I did. It's based on a 1922 car called a Mercer, M-E-R-C-E-R. -E and I saw online, I was looking up 1922 automobiles, yellow, or just 1922 roadsters. And this is a, was an image that I, out of a group of antique car shows. And it spoke to me right away. I thought, well, this has got to be the car because it wasn't defined in the book. Mm. Other than a roadster, yellow, speedy, fast, it's, you know, emotional. So that was, that was my inspiration for doing that. Now, I hope, let's see if we can do this. So my, I'm showing the art of the cover for public domain audiobooks. Is that covered up by anybody's screens or is it just me on this side? Um. I, there are icons on it, but you can still see what it says. Okay. It's fine. So these are... I love these the 480 are, coverage. Yeah, and I love the Jazz Age cover. <laughs> the Jazz Age cover is a blend of um, art that I got from Shutterstock. A very important place to go. There are a lot of subscription pay for images, but you don't always have to pay for images. In some cases, when I need a particular theme and I'm not clever enough to come up with it in my own art, I either go to um, uh, Shutterstock for it or I take a look at something like, um, I think it's Unsplash. Unsplash. Which is private, I mean, it's a public domain material. 
But my point on this screen is that anybody, you really can do this. If you are just getting started in public domain reading, you can do your own covers because you can be moved to the art by what you've just read. And I, you, your skill level doesn't have to be off the charts. Mine isn't. Um, I use the tools of Procreate and I use the tools of Photoshop, but only in the most basic ways. This is the example, you're gonna to go to free art sources. We have nasa.gov and libraryofcongress.gov. And on, on these pictures, for instance, on Dual on Certus over on the left, that's a NASA picture of Mars. I threw in the background of stars from another NASA picture. I did the crosshairs on my own. And then I, I went into Photoshop with the text and I bent the text. And, and that's, that was kind of it. On Sensitive Man, that's a NASA picture in the background. That's a, the profile of the guy I bought, but then I put the stars in his head and then worked on the type. And then the one on the Lincoln Trio on the far right, that is a public domain image of Abraham Lincoln doing an inaugural address that came from the Library of Congress. I never thought and about these as sources. This is gold. They're I just could have used great. That. You would love libraryofcongress.loc.gov slash photos. All kinds of good stuff. And just look at the difference. I mean, you guys, look at, oh my God, see, look at these covers. These are going to grab your attention if you're on Audible. I did Frankenstein. I'm not a man. I'm not a famous actor. Hundreds of people have done it. But the cover is the only reason I can think of that I'm still getting royalty share payments from it. It's a really good cover, Danielle. You did a super job. Covers, covers make a difference, don't they, Jim? They do. On on these, now these are two books that, that, to be honest, haven't sold particularly well because so many people have done them and I was new as an audiobook narrator when I did them. But I, the cover art, I, I collect 100-year-old um, and older art books. Hmm. And these, these two pieces of art, the one on the right was done by one of my grandfather's girlfriends. Uh, her name was Nissa McMain and she was an artist in the 1920s, a suffragette, a woman's rights, an equal rights person, outspoken, outstanding, an amazing artist. I used her art for Beautiful and Damned, and it was free. And then that's Charles Dana Gibson's art on, on the right with This Side of Paradise. And I have that book. So I, I scanned the book. I scanned the separate picture of the women and I hand colored them. So, but that was, they were all, they were both free. Yeah. This is the, the glory of getting free art along with doing a domain book. And it's fun. It's fun. Once you get into it, you start to like find different sources and. Well, and, and it's, yeah. And look at the source here. This is, this was a picture that I took from my apartment when I lived in Boulder, Colorado. And. Oh, wow. That was, it was a sunset and I went outside the apartment and it's a slightly wider picture, but that was the slide and that take was taken in 1969 and it stayed in my collection until 2014 when I did the Virginian and I started looking for a cover that would express both the name the Virginian, but the Rocky Mountain West. I do and have to I, put this in here though. Jim is a professional photographer. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, today people take fabulous photographs. Yeah. And you, my point, this is my point coming up. If you go on vacation to the beach, and we all do, and we take sunrise pictures, who hasn't done a sunrise picture? Yeah. Well, there was a quirky, funny little sci-fi book I did a couple of years ago called The Great Nebraska Sea. And I did it, A, because I used to live in Nebraska, but B, it was a, it's a stitch of a book. And I realized that I had an ocean picture, albeit the Atlantic, that could turn into a, a cover. And that's so all that is. That is a single picture with some text and boom, there's the cover. Y'all can do it. And it grabs your attention. This one, these are when the little beauties of life are right at your feet 
and it can become a cover. This flower, and I know one of you knows the name of it, and I've forgotten it, um, but I did it, it's in a, in a little park near my house, and I did a close-up picture. And They're probably, it's probably in the chat, but I can't see the chat, because, <laughs> sorry, Jim, I didn't mean to interrupt. It, you know, it, may, it may be, and I'm, I don't either. Um, but then I turned it into a sci-fi cover when I did Isaac Asimov's book. And I used the flower, as, and these are stars, but they're really pieces of pollen. And this is a globe. The, the circle is a globe that I got from NASA. And then the little bird cage. Um, I think I got that clip art. From, it could have been from Unsplash, something clipped. Cat, that was the, Cat says it's a blue bonnet. I will believe you. <laughs> I, I will believe you. This is this is how when I say repurpose, 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 I you never know where your pictures and art will go. The picture on the left, taken in 2005, was when I was with my youngest daughter looking at universities in Arizona. And we were driving from Phoenix down to Tucson. And that's down by the uh, Santa, oh gosh, what's the name? The, the mountain range just north of, of uh, Santa Catalina. Catalina. Mountains. And we pulled over. I took a picture of the cactus because it looked cool. Uh, and my daughter had never been up close to anything like that. She was born and raised in Virginia. So we took that. Years later, I did a charcoal artwork of it just because I wanted to see what I could do with my art. And then I read W.C. Tuttle's Spawn of the Desert, which is the horriblest name of a book I've ever narrated. <laughs> It's, I, I wanted to reach back in time and grab Tuttle by the throat and say, this is just a sick, sad title. And in the 21st century, no one is going to understand it, pal. But he, he would not respond to me. I did it. Channel, channel me, Tuttle. And it was, so... It, and I think everybody wants to shy away from the book, but they all like the cover. Yeah, the so cover is brilliant. That. This one, this was a mistake. And we, I make mistakes every single day. Um, except, and I will say this because this is going to be on YouTube as well. In two and a half months, I will celebrate the 50th anniversary of marrying the best thing I ever did which was find and say yes to my wife's proposal to me. So, but this was a piece of, of throwaway art. I was trying to figure out if I could squeeze out tubes of pigment from watercolors and sweep them across the paper to see what would happen. Wasn't related to the book, wasn't related to anything other than an experiment in my studio. And I set it aside and it dried and it crinkled up in, on a shelf. I read Civil Disobedience and looking for a cover, I thought, well, let's go for weird. Let's go for something upsetting slightly, maybe emotional, rise and fall of, you know, our, our feelings about our country. And so I did that. And I, all I had to do was scan it and I put in the text and then I hand wrote Disobedience because it's a disobedient way to abuse the cover. And there was my cover. Again, totally free, based on repurposed material. And you have a cover. And you know what, you remind me of my favorite thing. It's, people have heard me harp on about it. That's why I'm not afraid of AI. Because the beauty in art, in my opinion, are the mistakes. Absolutely. The, the rough edges, the things we did. This was a mistake I put on my cupboard four years ago and look at it now. That's art. I, I'm complete, I, I completely right. Get it. And, and here now, this is, this is going wow. a little bit toward what you have to pay for. Inside Earth, I paid for the head. I, just, <laughs> I, I saw it. I liked it. Um, the feeling of the story itself was this character looking over Earth, kind of like at the end of 2001 A Space Odyssey, but now it's a full-grown human. And I got a NASA picture of the Earth and a NASA picture of a galaxy. 
and I, in Photoshop, I just did layers and I layered them up and that became that in the cyber, that uh, gavel is actually my great, is my grandfather's Mason's gavel that I've held on to for all these years. And I took a photograph of that. I put it on top of the piece of art that I bought from Shutterstock of the circuit tree. Wait, Mason's like with some, Mason's like the ones in the robes and the secret yeah, rituals. Yeah. I, he was a he was a Mason and I've never known anyone that was a Mason. Very cool. Yeah, he was a Mason. So now this was Pillar of Fire. Love that. And this was so much fun to do. Um, the book itself is it's only an hour and a half. It's one of the most chilling books I've ever read. I I walked away from it. There's one exception we may have a chance to talk about. I walked away from it just going, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and and that, that whole feeling, even when I was doing it, and I did it in sort of a Kevin Spacey voice, but a, a darker side of Kevin Spacey, not quite, you know, uh-huh, <laughs> that sort of thing, looking right into the camera. So It's one of those where you, like, need a cot bath or shower after you do the book to yeah, wash it off. <laughs> you, you really do, and a, and a, good, a good vodka martini helped. Yeah. <laughs> so here, now, here is a quickie. This, let's see if this works. Um, okay. Now, this is 30 seconds of what it takes to do a cover. Are you painting that? This actually took six hours. <laughs> did but you paint this or did you do it in Photoshop? I did it in Procreate. And I recommend everybody try it. It's cheap. It's 20 bucks. But it's does it work on, on Windows though? Do you have to have eye stuff? Uh, yeah, it's an iPad right now. Yeah. And but that was that was just that was the process of trying to figure it out. How do you do a cover and you know, come up with I bought the text, I bought the script in black and white, and then I I painted the script, and then because of the title, clearly Pillar of Fire, I needed to create a really dramatic pillar of fire. So that's the, the thing on the, the top of the earth, and then the sun in the distance, which also plays into the story. So there are elements of the cover that play completely directly into the story. And then the last thing that I'll say, and I, and I say this because Stephen J. Cohen, um, and I told him I'd be sure to give credit. If you go to, if you haven't done work with Spoken Realms, please do. They are the best. If you're a new narrator and you want to break into getting audiobooks out there and you like spoken, you like public domain, Spoken Realms is the way to go. And Stephen has designed it so that you, it's almost foolproof. I mean, if I can use it, but these are the things that, that go into making a cover that we all have to adhere to to get our covers on Audible. And they're right there on the site, the website, Spoken Realms website. And as you're creating, you have to just keep this in mind and otherwise, otherwise have a great time doing it. So and don't just, you think it, it's good for you as a narrator to narrate public domain books because it's a different kind of writing. I think it's good for your skill, your level of competence to be able to narrate classics as I well. Think, I think it is. Thank you very Bye. much, Jim. That was very, that was, I really, the sample thing is huge for me because even with, ACX books, when you do it for the writer, you do a sample for them. And yeah. sometimes you just, you're busy and you do projects and you do the first few minutes of the book. And I think that doing it the way you're suggesting, you can create a sample that'll blow them away. That'll really, you know, impress them and, and, and grab people's attention, just like the cover. I always underrate, underestimate the sample. Well, and it, with Gatsby, for example, so many people have done it. I mean, starting January 2nd, when it was released, I think there were 17, 18, 19 that rolled out on the day one. And I got around to it near the end of the month. 
And so I was way down the list and I listened to all the samples and they all started the same way. I thought, well, if everybody samples like that, I need something different. So I, I went a little bit deeper into the book and then I did the cover and here we are. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's never too late, even for writers. We have a lot of writers watching these videos as well. If you have an old book cover on there, you can get it changed. If you're oh. not happy with a book cover or in love with it, why not? It's oh, easy absolutely. to get one that you are in love with. Yep, you absolutely can. And sometimes you want to do that anyway, because the book covers are vertical. Uh, they're portrait mode. And your cover has to be square. So... Yeah you're going to modify somebody's cover anyway, even if you scan it. Yeah. So why not do your own cover? Unless you could clearly scan their cover with a square and remain true to the artwork. That's fine. Yeah. For me, it's just easier to say, boy, that was a great cover in 1850, but I think a 2021 cover might be more appropriate, so. But it brings me back to, and we would touched on this before the call, and I'd said, let's not talk about it until the call. And I just think you're somebody that I know agrees with this and follows it, and I'm really, really striving for it. We were saying that when, when a narrator first starts, you have to get your head around the technicalities, the technical aspects of the job, yes. the marketing, the business, you get the coaching, and that's all really, really important. And yes. But I do feel that there's been a bit of a, and I'm responsible for it myself, I'm doing Cup of Joe, but there's been a bit of a hyper-focus on the social media aspect and the marketing aspect. And there's been an increase in messages I get all the time from people, I can't keep up, am I doing something wrong? Everyone's all posting this, and, I, and I'm... And then I see Jim posting things and it's always, it's always it, just because you post what you love and you love, you love what you get passionately engaged in something and it comes out, it spills over and we see it. And a few times when I am passionately engaged in something, I can't even remember doing it. Like the narration is just, it just appears and, and some, and I'm chasing that moment. I think there's a book about flow chasing that moment of yes. the joy of the job. I just think people are so focused on struggling and trying to get somewhere and the social aspect and the business and the marketing and doing everything right because it feels competitive and there are millions of people and we have to do it. And am I not fast enough? But there's, what about the joy? I'm looking at every one of those covers and I can feel how you felt when you made that cover. The joy for me is I love the art, but I like the sharing. Yeah. Um, I do believe that pay forward does mean something. It's a cliche, it seems. But I've been very lucky in my life, extraordinarily so compared to so many. And there's no reason at all why I need to hold any of that emotion in if by my voice or my art or my participation, somebody will be motivated to get out of their shell and try something. And, and cautionary tale, in 2019, I went to um, APAC in New York. It was my first time and I came away from it absolutely crushed. Not because of the people. Everybody from Romy Nordlinger to um, PJ and Sean Allen and all of the others were so supportive. Jenny was, Jenny Hoops was there and um, they were all helpful and welcoming. But I, I got on the Metro that night to come back to Washington and I realized how small I was in the world of audiobooks, how little I'd achieved, how I hadn't accomplished much, how there was such a long road ahead, how disorganized a person I was. I'm, and I, I stopped narrating for eight months because I felt 
inadequate to the task of meeting the expectations of the industry, of my peers, and of, of the listeners. And, I, and that feeling of small and unimportant um, almost, almost took me out of it entirely. And it wasn't until I, I found both the, the ways to get into myself through public domain and trying it on my own without the support network of Blackstone or trying to get um, Deanne to, I mean, I love Deborah and, and I, you know, we all want, we all want those experiences, but for me, sitting here in the dungeon, figuring it out, how do I do my audio? How do I do the edits? What have I learned in studio one? What have I learned in all the electronic techniques? And then reaching out to the editors and the proofers and becoming part of that community to get a book out, that is the most satisfying thing to me. Whether it it's, sells or not is not as important, which is where I fail because but, I don't sell, but I'm, I I'm gonna. I'm going to interrupt you only because I'm dying to get this out. And then I swear I'll apologize afterwards. What you just said about your experience at APAC, since I've started Joe, I couldn't have said this a couple of months ago. In the last few months, I have had at least five communications a week of people reaching out to me saying almost the, expressing almost the exact same sentiment. And that goes together, and I'm saying this for myself, for my own, because I had that feeling the day I got the vaccine, I was feeling down, um, too much had hit me all at once, and I looked at everything I did, and I thought, I actually called Stephen J. Cohen and said, I'm hor just tell me the truth, am I horrible, should I quit? I think he thinks I'm a little nuts at this point. But, but the thing is, and I know I'm so sick of hearing comparison, you know, it's, I get that we're not supposed to look at people on social. I get that. We all get that. We're smart people. We know better. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. matter. You yeah. feel incredibly like the tiniest clog in the biggest wheel on earth that you feel so insignificant because so many people are chasing significance where, and this is something Stephen said on his call. We're going to talk more about on his next call, what you've said and you put your finger right on it, is Stephen said that he focuses on his why is he wants to help people do their best work. I might get that totally wrong, Stephen, something like that, right? right? Your why, you've said your why because of your experience is to give back and to, so am I right that when you're narrating, it's huge. What you're, when you're away from the chasing significance, you're chasing your why. And that must be huge. You're huge in your dungeon doing this profound thing, giving back. I'm, I'm trying to read to somebody who is absent something in their life at the moment. Whether they're in the middle of a commute, they're having life struggles, whether they can't get to sleep at night, whether they're simply looking for something to get them away from the world. If that five-year-old blind me can have been given a gift from strangers, then why can't the 72-year-old me realize that there are people out there who are in need of something other than the real world? And that's they're, huge. And so, and I think that's true with almost all of us who narrate. Yeah. Uh, we, but we lose touch with it. We feel like sometimes. like what we're doing isn't, it's the chasing the money, chasing money, chasing significance, chasing, are we doing it properly? But those moments, that's a, that's a big why, Jim. It, it's a, keep in mind that the, the, I did 30 years in government on and off. I was, when I wasn't at time as a photographer, I was in government. I was a speech writer. And in Washington, the one thing you never want to tell people that you are is a speechwriter. Um, <laughs> with the exception of the Peggy Noonans and the Favros and others, we are part of the silent profession. And you, you can't brag about what you do because your client, your boss, a secretary, 
of a cabinet does not want many of them don't really want people to know that they've got people like me. So when you do that for a living for so long in the pressure of Washington, when it comes to pushing yourself on social media, you don't know how to do it. Yeah. You don't know how to say, look at me. Um, you don't know how to approach the publishers and say, I'm your guy. Um, because you've been told over and over and over again, quietly, silently, don't make yourself known. And it becomes, it becomes part of your being to be shy, to retire from moving yourself out there. Suddenly, when you're faced with Sean Allen Pratt, who is giving you, you know, lessons <laughs> and tasks, <laughs> goals, and you say, but Sean, I'm afraid of doing that. I don't know how. And he slaps you upside the face. He says, go out and do it because that's what you need to do. And the, I'm trying. The, I'm, the, try. I'm <laughs> learning a trick though. The, the, what I'm teaching myself, and it really, really has helped, except for last week. But every once in a while, it doesn't help. But most of the time, all those things, because Sean is right, we have to do those things. Yeah. But we don't have to do those things from, I can't remember which side of the brain, left, right. I use my analytical, is that the right side? My analytical side of the brain to do those things. So I send my letters out every week on the dot as an admin task. I'm not sending, oh my God, oh my God, okay, I've got to get a publisher job. I'm going to send the letters out today. And then I send four letters out and then I sit there. And then like next week, I feel really worried because nobody's gotten back to me. And by the week afterwards, I'm pretty sure I'm just destined to never, ever speak to another human being again, because obviously they hated me, right? <laughs> but if it's an admin task every week, you send it out. It's, it's like doing the auditions on ACX if you're doing them or touching base with whatever, you know, be audio if you're working for them every seven weeks. I'm just doing it. It's, it's on the calendar and not think about it Good. and not wrap myself up and bring that what you said, the emotion and the energy into the booth instead, because I waste so much emotion and energy on Facebook going, what did they mean by that? Or did I offend someone that I've never met and will never meet and probably never have a conversation with, but I'm really worried I'll offend them and I can worry about it for three or four hours. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that can be a, a day killer. Yeah, it's just keeping get it. Get into your head. Admin, tick this box, yeah. tick this box and get on with the important work. Which well, is and you do. I mean, you, you, you're putting them out there. Whether I, mean, I get your passion, everything I listen to. And I think what you're doing is exactly what we should all be doing. And you're, you're at a level now where you can be breaking into that Heller, Pratt, Oh, level. no, no, I'm serious. They've done like 6,000 audio books. <laughs> no, but, the, but you the can. Thing, the thing is, you're putting, you're putting in the time. I want to be like you. I do. I want to be like you. I want to be obviously proud of my work. That is what I'm chasing. And it's become an obsession because I want to be a true artist. And, and I want to be a purist. I want to be a true artist. I'm very, very easily distracted by shiny things. How many friends do I have? How many likes do I have? Oh, I'll take selfies. I'll order 17 expensive glass frames for Instagram. <laughs> I don't even need glasses. I'm very easily derailed. I want to be, and Stephen J. Cohen is another one. He does work he loves. And you can see, you can hear it. You can hear it. Uh, yes. See, but you, but you wear glasses all the time, don't you? No, half the time. Not, do, yeah. Not when I'm not in the studio. Yeah, I'm gonna look like I suddenly need them because I found a place that sells them with rhinestones, and a girl can't <laughs> say no. I, I think I've got a bit of like your mother in me. I, <laughs> I wish I was in Hollywood. <laughs>
mm-hmm. something I would never even read, like ever, the MC Beaton books. I think there's like 25 in the series. And at the worst point, I listened to the whole series four times over. Whoa. Because of Penelope Keith. Because she inhabited the characters so much, so well, that I got to forget my life. And, and, and that. that's what you say you're doing. That's what your goal is to do with each book. And I think you're succeeding admirably because I think that if you're putting the love into your work and you're sharing the work with people, you're sharing your love with them. And a lot of people, we all need that at some time of our life. You as the four or five year old boy needed it, received it, and yeah, you're giving very, it back. I was very fortunate and, I, and I've, been, I've been blessed with a lot of good people around me all my life and supportive people. And I've got a super family. I mean, I love my kids and my grandchildren. I've got a son who lives in Australia that makes it a little bit more difficult. But um, it's, it's time for me, you know, the clock is ticking at 72. And it's time for me to be sure that the things that I love in life, the things that, that bring me some pleasure, have a chance to do the same for other people. Whether I get paid for it or not is another matter. But when I sit down with the public domain book and decide to read it, I'm all in. Yeah. And I'm all in for that book. I'm not all in it for anything else than to share it with people who have never heard the name Owen Wister and wouldn't know the Virginian or wouldn't know Paul Anderson or anybody else. I want to introduce them to people in my life that I've heard in my head. No, well, not all the things I hear in my head. But you, know. <laughs> but you feel a sense of ownership because it's more yeah. yours. When it's your writer's book, you're proud and you're happy for your writer, but it's always their book. A public domain book, most of the time the writer's dead anyway, And but it's... E- it's yours, you know, it's your baby, it's your cover, it's your, you know. Well, it's, a, it's a challenge to do it in a way nobody else is doing yeah. it at the moment. Because very few public domain books, with the exception of the big names, like, like Fitzgerald, are getting done by the handful or by the gross. You'll do a one-off, a two-off, a three-off. And so that makes your book somewhat unique already. And it's like, then you've just put a bow on it and you send it out as a gift to the people who might be interested. Yeah. And if they like it, great. Uh, you never know. Now, I don't, I don't follow my statistics. I just don't. I don't look at reviews. I don't look at place where I'm placed. There's, I don't look at my reviews either. And it's, but think about the feeling. I mean, even just now, the feeling of like, I'm wanting to like ditch my actual what I'm supposed to be doing and get back on the scarlet letter as fast yeah. as possible. <laughs> but that feeling of excitement, if you told me two weeks ago when I was having a bad day and thought I was rubbish and, oh my God, why have I not achieved this, this, and this? Then if you told me that now, it's laughable. It's nothing. Because I'm remembering how it feels. Do you know what I, That's what I, I wanted. It's infectious. Your love for what you do infects us all in a good way i love it well thank you you're welcome i do i really love it um what's the next one you're doing i haven't found it yet ah i so haven't found t- it yet because i'm going down to see my children in a week in a few days oh um, your daughter the one that did designing women is she an actor she is who amazing she did a skit about designing women. Who? Your daughter. You've got this daughter that does TikTok things. Oh, gosh. Charlotte. Is she an Charlotte. actress? Charlotte is amazing. She's what? Is she an actress? Uh, no. She's a copywriter. She, she has been an actress, and she's marvelous. And she has a, a singing voice that just will knock you dead. I saw one of her, she did a TikTok video singing as well. Why is she not a working actress instead of a copy? Maybe she loves copywriting. No, but you'd have to ask Char. And I'm sure after this video, she'll probably. Okay, please tell her she has to be. She is next level. And I'm sorry, I've I've shown 
tons of friends that video the designing woman one she is spectacular it is obviously in the blood well she loves she loves doing it i think she now has a quarter of a million followers on tiktok right so she should be making a proper living at this she should have her own show she's amazing quick copywriting i don't even know know her she's gonna be like who is this one Is it, is it, can people look it up? Everyone should watch it. It's gorgeous. Do you still have a link to it? He's under Cavatica, C-A-V-A-T-I-C-A, Cavatica on TikTok. On TikTok. And she does a designing woman skit, you guys, that will make you laugh so hard you wet your pants. It's hysterical. She's amazing. She's 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 really, really good. She's a funny woman. I love her to death. So, okay. Yeah. So. Final words for our YouTube audience that's going to be watching this in the next 60 or 70 years. Words of wisdom, reprimand, anything? Words for me? Yeah. What would you like them to be left with? The words of wisdom are don't worry about what other people think about, about you and your work. Uh, Don't overthink things in life. Your first response is probably the right one when it comes to choosing a book, when it comes to being a a giving, caring, kind person. And you can be a giving, caring, and kind person in your narration. You can choose books that will give something back and you can choose books that are good for you. And if you can choose a book that's good for you, that makes you feel good, that makes you feel as if you have empowered yourself to become someone else for six, 10, 15 hours, go for that and then give it away and things will come back to you eventually. Don't wait for them, just put it out there and go for kindness and I think you'll do all right. I love that, that is that is epic. I'm not gonna say much more because I don't wanna spoil that. I wanna leave everyone on that note. Jim well, Moore. You. Thank you so much. I'm honored to have had you on the Cup of Joe. I'm so glad you came. I feel so motivated and positive now, well, and I need it. For all the people that you've had ahead of me and you've had a star list, I am truly, um, I'm, I'm really humbled by your asking. And thank you very, very much. And thank you, all of you who came. I, I appreciate your taking the time in your day for sharing this and uh, I wish you all well. Thank you. I only have stars and you're one of the stars. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. It's been fabulous. I'll have the video out next week. Take care and thanks, Jim. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Come on, everybody, tap along. First you scrub a dub, then you tap and rub. You might have to yell when you hear the bell ring out loud and long. 